From MTN News, this is Montana This Morning. Coming up, an update on one of the city's biggest traffic projects. That one is, uh, is exciting for the community. Plus, a new campaign looks to end suicide. Hope that people continue to utilize it, too. And we'll tell you how marijuana sales could be good news for Montana wildlife. And good morning and welcome to Montana this morning on this Tuesday, September 6th. We do have breaking news to share with you. A downtown billing stabbing has landed a man in the hospital, two others in police custody. The victim is said to be in critical condition. The stabbing happening around 1.30 this morning, the 2000 block of 6th Avenue North. Police say they still are investigating what lad led to that stabbing. New this morning, Donald Trump is celebrating a legal victory in the ongoing investigation into his handling of classified documents. A judge authorized a legal expert to review the records seized during last month's raid of Mar-a-Lago. A special master separates any items that might be protected by claims of attorney client privilege or executive privilege. The ruling blocks the DOJ from using those documents in an investigation until the special master is done with them. Well, this morning there's an update on the Billings Bypass project to connect Lockwood and the Billings Heights. Now that crews finished the Yellowstone River Bridge, they'll move on to the next phase of that project. Q2's Alina Howder has more. It seems like construction on the Billings Bypass project never ends, and there's a good reason for that. There have been um, various iterations, um, the environmental impact study, um, followed by the design, followed by construction. Led by the Montana Department of Transportation, it's broken into six segments. The first segment was the construction of Five Mile Road, which has been completed. The Yellowstone River Bridge segment is the second part of the project that's almost wrapped up. The Yellowstone River Bridge is not open to the public. The next segment, the railroad overpass segment, will allow for a connection. That overpass is segment number three and will connect to the southeast side of the bridge. Olmsted says construction on that will let likely start this year. Once that segment is complete, there will actually be a temporary connection to Colson Road. The public won't have to wait for the entire Billings Bypass project to be complete before they can use the bridge. They just have to wait for segment number three. It will include a bridge over the railroad and over Colson Road. Segment number four, the Johnson Lane Interchange, is currently in the design phase with construction anticipated to begin in the next year or so. That one is, uh, is exciting for the community though because it will be Montana's first diverging diamond interchange. It's hard to say exactly when the entire project will be complete, but Olmsted hopes it's a year or two after construction begins on segment number six. The final segment, the road that will be constructed north of Mary Street, is anticipated to start in 2026. That road will be similar to Rimrock Road with two lanes and a 45 mile speed limit. There's actually a concurrent project that shares the Billings Bypass name. The Billings Bypass Corridor Study is led by the City County Metropolitan Planning Organization. We've been and doing a uh an assessment of utilities, floodplain, drainage. It's basically a collection of information that will be used to determine the future of the area. A draft of the document is available on our website. We'll be having a public meeting for the corridor study this coming Thursday, September 8th at Independent School in the Heights. Olmsted invites the public to voice their opinions at this meeting before the document is finalized and delivered to the city for future planning efforts. In Billings, Alina Howder, MTN News. All right, and here's our Miller Robson. He's talking to us about that weather. Yeah, buddy, and uh, another smoky day out there. Yeah. Maybe maybe not as smoky as yesterday, but, yeah. uh, well, you can see it out there yeah, right now. Yeah, you can. Yeah, we had that westerly flow. It may ease a little bit today, Andrea, but folks who do have respiratory ailments, it's still not going to be very good for you today, so just keep that in mind. Let's go ahead and crunch some numbers. It got hot yesterday, high of 96. Of course, it was shy of a record, but still hot nonetheless. Overnight low of 58. Uh, uh, wind speed, top gust of 23 at the airport. You notice it's a, a dry start to September, not seeing any measurable rain. So we're falling in the hole, but for the year, we're still pacing ahead. We do have rain in the forecast, maybe as early as tomorrow night. We'll break that down mm. with the main forecast coming up in just a bit. Uh, but uh, today we're not going to be as hot. It's still going to be hot, maybe extreme heat to our, our east. But we're going to cool down just a bit today and then really get hot tomorrow before a big cool down comes in as we head toward the end of the week. 63 right now at the airport, humidity at 27%. Winds out of the west at about 6 miles an hour. Mainly 50s and 60s right now. Highs today, we'll just call it mainly 90s. Could see some 80s, could see some mid to uh, upper 90s or some areas trying to get there. But the real big heat up comes tomorrow where we could see some record temperatures. But hang on. Yeah. We've been talking about a cool down. Yes, it's coming, but when? I'll let you know here in just a second. So do you think that 
that smoke will blow out kind of with those changes? Well, no, no, actually it may increase a little bit because if we, we have this cold front coming in, you're going to have these winds chasing in behind that front. So it actually may increase over the course of the okay. next few days. So we'll definitely have to keep an eye on that, but just a slight break today. So at least that's some good news. Okay, well, that's good. All right. Yeah. Miller, thanks so much. We'll oh. see you in just a little bit. Okay. All right, Montana's suicide rate is alarming, sitting at the third highest in the nation. But now there's a new way to promote those who are uh, to promote health for those silently suffering. This morning, Q2's Haley Monaco shows us how a local group is working to reverse the trend. You may notice some new yard signs popping up around Billings, like the one behind me here. We spoke with the group behind those signs who are finding a new way to raise awareness about the 988 hotline. I lost my dad to suicide. And I think like so many other families, we were just completely blown out of the water. And his friend said, you know, when your dad was in town and he saw you walking down the street, he would stop and he would ask in earnest how you were doing. Darla Tyler McSherry lost her father to suicide on their family farm in 2016. Hearing that story from her father's friend really stuck with her. And in 2018, she created Ask in Earnest to help farmers and ranchers. Farm and ranching has disproportionate rates of suicide in comparison to, to other occupations. Ask in Earnest is just one of the five groups partnered with the Suicide Prevention Coalition of Yellowstone Valley for the Yard Sign Campaign. So the point of the yard sign is, is to promote the 988 number, but also promote different groups and organizations that are specifically working on suicide prevention in the community. Montana first began using the 988 hotline in July. Sarah Music is the chairperson of the Suicide Prevention Coalition and says the hotline did see a little increase in calls when the number first became an option. Hope that people continue to utilize it too. If you are worried about someone struggling, you can also use the hotline for guidance on how to help. No longer do we have to worry about memorizing that long number. The signs of hope will be up through September 30th, providing awareness and guidance to those who may need it most. In Billings, Haley Monaco, MTN News. All right, thanks so much, Haley. Montana's conservation districts are struggling with funding, but state environmental leaders are hoping Montana's marijuana money might be able to help. The districts are designed to help both landowners and the state. For example, a farmer may allow the state to plant near willows near water on their property to stop erosion while improving wildlife habitat. Right now, much of the funding for those projects comes from declining coal tax revenue. What it does is it floats everybody's boats a little bit higher. We believe that functional conservation districts across the state who can do the project work that they want to do with the funding that benefits the greater population, it's valuable. The Environmental Quality Council is set to discuss the proposed bill draft at their next meeting. That's going to happen on Thursday. New this morning, there's encouraging signs that oil prices will start to fall a little faster. OPEC is announcing a small reduction in oil production starting next month. It signals a small drop in demand, and if it stays that way, the producers may have to sell it for less. OPEC countries meet when production impacts the market. One of the men accused of a mass stabbing in Canada is on the run, while his brother, an alleged accomplice, is dead. Police say they're still searching for Miles Sanderson while his brother's body was found by police. The men are accused of stabbing dozens of people, killing 10. Police say they don't have a motive. Deadly wildfires are spreading through California this morning. Record temperatures are fueling those flames, which have already killed two people. CBS's Bradley Blackburn has the latest on the firefight. This one is on Avery Canyon. Overnight, a wildfire burned through at least a half dozen homes in Hemet, California. A brush fire sparked Monday afternoon and quickly spread to more than 700 acres. Some 1,500 homes were evacuated and firefighters rushed to help people trapped by the flames. You see just how hellacious this fire looks tonight. Firefighters are battling changing wind conditions and extreme temperatures. Six air tankers and four helicopters were grounded until daylight returns. In the afternoon, the winds are going to shift and blow the opposite direction. Uh, so that could be a big concern for firefighters. So I wouldn't say we're out of the woods at this time. Uh, we have a lot of work to do. The fire spread so fast it caught many off guard as it engulfed homes. Officials say two people were killed and another civilian suffered burns on the arms, back and face. We did have multiple people that were trapped uh, by this fire. Uh, this area, uh, Gilbo Road, it's a one way in, one way out road. And where the fire started, it started on the back side of that community. Across California, at least 14 large fires are burning. 
In Northern California, the Mill Fire is blamed for the deaths of two people and destroyed some 100 homes over the weekend. Terrible. I lost everything. Uh, Animals, house, cars, RV, boats, and across the run. The National Weather Service warns elevated fire risk will continue in parts of the state through Wednesday. Bradley Blackburn, CBS News. The heat wave is also testing the power grid in California. Officials are warning of blackouts as temperatures remain in the triple digits. Pediatricians are warning that this year's flu season could be hard on our kids. They say infection rates were lower last year because of COVID precautions, and that's why they're promoting the flu vaccine for children six months and older. Last year, just 55% of children got vaccinated, and health experts say both the shot and the nasal spray are effective ways to distribute the vaccine for children. Employers are turning to robots to fill their jobs. Reporter Tyler Atkinson tells us how it's impacting the U.S. economy. North American companies are onboarding robot workers at a faster than ever pace. According to the Association of Advancing Automation, companies ordered a record setting 12,305 machines in the second quarter of 2022. That's 25% more than the same period a year ago. The pandemic um, definitely highlighted some areas that uh, shortages in resources needed to be automated um, and customers had to automate uh, just due to the fact that uh, people weren't coming back to the workplace. So for a long time, the automotive industry accounted for 60 to 70 percent of robot orders. And we knew that when other industries started adopting is when you would really see growth. Well, it's finally happening now, in part due to the pandemic, forcing companies to look at other options when they couldn't bring people into work. Bernstein and Fanazzo told Newsy that the industries helping fuel this increased demand ranged widely from food processing to pharmaceuticals. E-commerce companies have been particularly interested in buying up these robots, as robots can grab packages and get them ready for delivery. However, if these robots are meant to close productivity gaps, the results aren't apparent. During the second quarter of 2022, U.S. productivity fell at its highest rate since the government began collecting that data. Robots can help do the tasks businesses need done, but it will take time to get those machines up and running, and they'll need a human workforce with specialized training. The lack of people who are available to install, maintain, operate, program, take advantage of all the data, this is a a barrier actually to further adoption of robotics um, and it starts in the school systems you know we have to put more emphasis on teaching people the skills they need because we all have to benefit in an increasingly automated future experts are pleased with how quickly robots are being added to the workplace a mechanized future is well on its way a lot about is that the adoption curve used to be 50 weeks one year now it's been cut into the 20 week range. So you will see uh, uh, gains happening quicker because uh, the customers and the manufacturers are picking applications that they can get immediate impact. Tyler Adkison, Newsy, Chicago. Well, the Montana State Fund is using humor to remind workers to stay safe on the job. Well, the Naked Without It advertising campaign equates not wearing a hard hat or safety glasses to wearing nothing at all. These ads target 18 to 25 year olds, the group most likely to experience a workplace injury. This campaign is designed to increase awareness so that we can drive down injuries in Montana. And that's the, the number one part of our mission and what we do. And according to 2019 statistics, Montanans were more likely to experience non-fatal injuries and illnesses when compared to the national average.